So I want to talk a little bit about how healthcare delivery is transforming all around the world. And so whenever we talk about virtual healthcare, virtual care delivery here in Canada, this is a topic that's not familiar, especially in this country. It may be familiar to this audience because this is a very forward-thinking audience. This is an audience that knows a lot about technological change and a lot about innovation that's happening around the world. But when we talk about virtual care delivery to the average person in Canada, this even cl includes physicians that I work with. So I'm a practicing emergency room physician as well as running Maple. What we get is a lot of skepticism. People don't understand the idea that you actually can successfully deliver care virtually at a distance. So there's always this question mark about how do you take care of a patient when you're not in the same room? How do you make a diagnosis when you're not touching this patient? And so the easiest way that we answer this and the best way to look to see just how effective healthcare delivery can be done if it's actually done remotely and done effectively in a holistic manner actually takes place from south of the border. So we do like to criticize our, Americans, uh, our American neighbors south of the border a lot in terms of their delivery of healthcare, but one of the things that they've done very well is virtual care delivery. So the best example that I've seen is actually out of a hospital system called Kaiser Permanente. So Kaiser is the largest hospital system in the United States, and they have 10 million patients. So to put that into perspective, the number of patients at this one hospital system is equal to the entire population of the province of Ontario. So if this hospital can get it right, there's no question that our province can get it right as well. And so when we look at what they've done, they, in the last year, did 13 million of their patient visits virtually, meaning that there was no in-person touching of those patients. That's 13 million people who, when they had an ailment, didn't have to drive across town, didn't have to get into a waiting room, didn't have to be exposed to other people's flu bugs to have their, their twisted ankle looked at. That's pretty amazing. They actually did 52% of all of their visits last year virtually, meaning they did more virtual care than in-person care. And I'm gonna let the actual, the CEO of Kaiser speak for himself. There's a little video of him here where he talks about just what they've achieved in the last year. It's pretty impressive just to hear his take on it. So you heard that. So better quality, more convenience. So these are the things that we need to drill into people's heads because when we look at virtual care in, here in Canada, People say, how can it have the same quality? How can you have the kind of care outcomes that we have in person? Here's a hospital system that's the size of all of Ontario, and they're doing better quality, better patient satisfaction, more convenience, more rapid care. So what are we doing here in Ontario right now? How do we compare? So if you look at what we're doing here in Canada, so you know there is some virtual care. So in Ontario, we have the Ontario Telemedicine Network. They're doing several hundred thousand virtual visits per year. But if you look across the entire country, there are less than 500,000 virtual visits done in all of Canada out of 180 million visits per year to the doctor in Canada. That's about 0.25, it's just over 0.25%. So let's compare Kaiser to what we're doing in Canada. Kaiser, 53% of their visits last year virtual. Canada, 0.25%. The opportunity for us to improve is tremendous. We are behind and it's a huge opportunity for us to make care more convenient and more effective and to improve access to care here in this country. So the next question, just the natural question is, how do we get there? How do we go from 0.25% up all the way to the 50% level and can we do it? So, you know, this is a really long discussion. You know, our healthcare system is very different. There are many different levers here in Canada than what we have in the United States. It's a little bit tougher to affect change here than it would be across a privately held hospital system in the United States. But that being said, one of the key things, and rather than saying, how do we do it? One of the questions, first of all, is why should we do it? Why should we care? So one of the reasons why we should care, actually, is that access to care in Canada actually happens to be the longest, the most delays in access to care of all developed nations. So when we look, one third of Canadians are waiting more than six days to see a family doctor when they're ill. We have more Canadians being driven to see to go to the emergency room for care than in any other developed nation. So 44% of Canadians every two years have to go to the emergency room for care versus when we look at nations in Europe, it's about 22%. So we should care because we have an access to care problem. So the way, and I'm running out of time here, I think I've got one minute, but the way that we get from where we are to where Kaiser is, it's gonna be a long path, but one of the easiest ways is to focus on the pain points. And what are the pain points? Our number one pain point in Canada is that we have an access to care problem. So if we try to hit it where Canadians really need help, which is to see a doctor quickly when they need it, when they're sick, that's a great start to get us on the pathway towards further adoption of virtual care, because virtual care allows us to actually match the supply of physicians all across the country to that demand that's there at all times. I'll stop right there, thank you very much.
Any questions? Uh, see one in the back there? department and oh hey um, I really love virtual care I think it's really important but this kind of sticky point for me is that in terms of accessibility you know patients have to pay out of pocket for these kind of companies and then mm -hmm. that leaves out like a huge cohort of the population that you know can't and so mm -hmm. since it's not through OHIP I just I don't know how you guys uh, think about that mm -hmm. And what you thought. Well, well, I think you, you've hit the nail on the head, is that right now, virtual care here in Canada, it's not as accessible as it should be because it's not funded. And so, really the question that we have to ask is, when we have new ideas, when we have innovations, when we see something that's working really effectively in other countries that's not funded by our government yet, the question is, do we not do it? Do we not try it? Do we not try to validate that it works? And so the answer is, it should be funded. This is something that should be available to everybody, and it should be accessible to all of our all of our population equally. So the way that we make that happen is we, we do what we can. We fund it privately, we fund it through employer health plans, same way dental care is funded, the same way going to chiropractic is funded, the same way pharmaceuticals are funded for the vast majority of Canadians. There's a lot of employers that have stepped up to the plate to actually fund those types of care, and a lot of them are stepping up to the plate to say, you know, virtual care is something that our employees should have, let's put it into a benefits package. And so if we fund it that way, and if the value of virtual care is demonstrated here in Canada, and Canadians say they love it, and Canadians demand it, and we show that it's actually taking a load off of our government-funded healthcare system, well, then government's going to follow along. So I would say that, yes, this is not the ideal state right now, but the pathway to get to the ideal state is that we try it and we do everything we can to show that it works. Uh, today, the diagnostics as well as the treatments are highly uh, data-driven, uh, i.e. the doctors can only do something or give any opinion or advice based on the test results. Now, do I understand it correctly that uh, the uh, virtual care would only be applicable to those situations where you already have those data available? Uh, I, I think you're describing one potential situation, but I think that the ideal solution, solution is an integrated solution, so whereby physicians who are seeing patients virtually, they can order the, di the diagnostics that are needed. Those patients can go out, get the diagnostics done, or some, in some cases there are actually facilities where people can come to their homes to do blood draws, where you integrate with the facilities that are already out there, and then the follow-up of those test results can be done virtually. So I think we all know that a lot of the laboratory providers, for instance, have online portals right now where you, know, you can look up your blood test results or you can look up whatever result that they've done. One of the biggest questions, one of the biggest issues in our system right now is you get that blood work drawn and you see a result result in that portal, well, now who do you talk to about the result? It's a struggle to get to your family doctor, and you phone them for an appointment, and you might get an appointment a week later, two weeks later, and meanwhile you're stressing for two weeks over that thing that you saw in the portal that may or may not be important. How about there was a button in that portal where you could say, click to see a doctor right now? And this is the world that we can live in if we integrate virtual care properly with diagnostics and if we fund things properly. So I absolutely agree with you. I think diagnostics has to be a big part of it, and if we do things properly, it will be a part of it. <laughs> 